In the winter, the snowstorms raged in the street. Paul stripped the houses, and the French used to run up to our window, where my mother stood baking loaves, and they would shout and jump around, banging on the glass, asking for warm loaves. <coughs> mother never let them into the house, but pushed the bread through the open window. <coughs> The French would seize them all hot and covered with flour, dust, and stuff them inside their shirts, right against their bellies. How they survived that kind of life will always be a mystery. A lot of them died of cold, the ones who were used, used to a hot climate and had never known frost. Two of them lived in our bathhouse in the garden, an officer and his batman, Miron. The officer was tall and thin, all skin and bones and went around in a woman's cloak, which came down to his knees. He was very friendly, but he drank a lot. Mother used to brew beer on the quiet and sell it. He'd go and buy some, get drunk, and start singing. He picked up some Russian and used to jabber, Your country not white, black, wicked. He spoke Russian very badly, but you could understand what he was saying, and he knew what he was talking about. He used to say the climate in the north of Russia was harsh, but that it got warmer down south along the Volga and beyond the Caspian. You don't see any snow at all. And it seems to make sense to me. Nothing's said about snow or winter in the Gospels, nor even in the Acts, not even in the Psalms. And that's where Christ lived, down in the south, where we finished the Psalms. When we finish the Psalms, we'll go on to the Gospels. He would lapse into silence again, appearing to doze off. He seemed to have grown small again, and sharp-edged as he squinted and looked out of the window, lost in thought. Tell me some more, I would say softly, trying to bring him back to the story. Well, he'd say with a start, I was telling you about the French, wasn't I? Well, they're human beings, and no worse than us sinners. They used to shout out to my mother, Madame, Madame, which means my lady, that Madame. That Madame would carry more than a hundred pounds of flour from the Chandlers. She was too strong to be a woman, and right up to that time, I was twenty, she could swing me around by the hair like nothing, and I was no featherweight. Now this Batman, Myron, loved horses. He would wander from yard to yard and ask if they'd let him groom the horses. This he had to do by making signs with his hands, as he couldn't speak our language. At first everyone was afraid to let him touch them, as he was one of the enemy, after all, and he might make a mess of it. But afterwards, the sable hands themselves used to call out to him, Come help us, Myron. He would laugh, put his head down, and charge like a bull. His hair was almost as red as a carrot, and he had a big nose and thick lips. He was very good with horses and produced miraculous cures for them when they were ill. Later on, he became a horse doctor here in Nizhny, but he went mad in the end, and the men from the fire brigade beat him to death. Towards spring, the officer fell ill with consumption and on St. Nicholas Day passed quietly away. He was sitting musing at the bathhouse window, and there he died, his head hanging out of the window. I felt sorry for him and even had a little cry. He was a gentle person and very often caught hold of my ears to whisper something in his own language that I couldn't understand, but which I knew was kind. You can't buy affection in this world. Once he started teaching me French, but my mother stopped him, and he even took me along to the priest, and he even took me along to the priest who had me flogged and complained about the officer. People were cruel then, and that's something you won't have to suffer. Others have suffered for you. Never forget this. Look what I went through. It was dark now. Grandfather seemed to have grown mysteriously bigger in the twilight, and his eyes gleamed like a cat's. About everything except himself, he spoke softly, thoughtfully, cautiously. But when he was the subject, he grew excited and boastful, and talked feverishly and very quickly. I didn't like it when he started talking about himself, and neither did I like his incessant orders. Remember that. Don't forget it now. Much of what he told me I didn't want to remember, but without any instructions on Grandfather's part, many things stuck in my memory, like painful splinters. He never told me any fairy stories, only about things that had really happened, and I noticed he didn't like questions. For this reason, I kept asking questions like, who's better, the French or the Russians? How do I know? I've never seen what they're like in their own country. He would snarl angrily and then add, 
Even a skunk is all right in his own burrow. And are all Russians good? In their own small way, they were better under the landowners. Strong as wrought iron they were. Now they're all free and they've got nothing to eat. The gentry, of course, are a hard lot. Then they've got a good deal more common sense. You can't say that about all of them, but if you come across a good gentleman, then you have to admire him. But some are idiots, like sacks, and they'll hold whatever you stuff them with. There's a lot of empty shells around today. At first sight, they look like human beings, but go a bit closer and you'll see they're not people, but empty shells, with all the goodness inside eaten away. Nowadays, we must try to learn as much as we can, sharpen our wits, but there's no real grindstone. Are the Russians strong? A few, but it's a question of skill rather than strength. A horse is always more powerful than the strongest of us. But why did the French fight us? The war is the Tsar's business. It's not for us to understand, but I shall always remember how he answered when I asked him who Napoleon was. He was a bold man who wanted to conquer the world. He wanted everyone to be equal, no lords or civil servants, but simply a world without classes. Names would be different but everyone would have the same rights and the same fate. I don't have to tell you what nonsense that all is. Only crabs are all alike, but fish are different. The sturgeon's no friend to the catfish, and the sterlet doesn't mate with the herring. We've had our own bone parts, raisin, Fuji, Fujikov. I'll tell you about them some other time. Sometimes he would stare at me long and silently, his eyes open wide as if he had just seen me for the first time. This I found very unpleasant, and he never spoke about my father or mother. Grandmother often used to join us in these conversations. She would sit quietly in one corner out of sight, and after long silence would suddenly ask Grandfather, in that caressing voice of hers, Do you remember the good times we had when we went on a pilgrimage to Rome? What year was that? After a moment's reflection, Grandfather replied, taking great pains to get his facts straight, I don't know exactly, but it was before the Korea epidemic, when they were chasing those Olincons in the forest. That's right, I remember. How frightened we were at that time. Hmm, yes. I asked who the Olincons were, and why they were being chased through the forest. Grandfather reluctantly replied, The Olincans were just peasants on the run from the hangman, or from factory work. How did they catch them? How do you think? It was like boys playing in the street. Some of them ran away and others went after them. When they caught up with them, they whipped and flogged them. They even had their nostrils slit and their foreheads branded to show they'd been punished. What for? It's hard to say who was in the wrong. Those who did the running away are the ones who were after them. Do you remember, Grandmother asked again, the time after the Great Fire? A stickler for accuracy, Grandfather would ask sternly, What Great Fire? As they reminisced, I was completely forgotten. Their quiet voices blended so well, they seemed to be seen. And it was a sad song, about illness, fires, floggings, sudden deaths, clever swindles, holy idiots, cruel masters. The things we've been through, Grandfather muttered softly. You think it's been a bad life, said Grandmother. Remember that wonderful spring after I had Varya? That was in 48, the year of the Hungarian campaign. The day after the christening, her godfather, Tikhon, was taken away. And he never came back, sighed grandmother. Yes, never came back, ever since God's gifts began to flow into our house, like water after a raft, over a raft. Ah, Barbara. That's enough, father. He looked angry and frowned. Enough of what? Our children turned out to be failures, whatever way you look at them. Where's all our strength and youth gone to? We thought we were putting everything into a strong basket, but God put a badly made sieve into our hands instead. He cried out just as if he'd burnt himself and ran around the room bitterly complaining, cursing his children and threatening grandmother with his little bony fists. And you were always on their side, the robbers, you witch. Roused to wailing in tears by these painful memories, he hid in the corner where the icons were kept, and he beat his thin, hollow-sounding chest with wild movements. God, am I worse than anybody else? He was shaking all over, and his moist eyes shone spitefully from a sense of outrage. Grandmother, who was sitting in the darkness, silently crossed herself, and then, approaching him cautiously, began her exhortations. 
Why torment yourself like this? God knows what he's, what he's doing. And are other people's children any better than ours? It's the same everywhere. Quarrels, arguments, chaos, and confusion. All parents wash away their sins with their own tears. You're not the only one. Sometimes these speeches would calm him, and he would wearily fall on the bed without saying a word, while grandmother and I went quietly away to our attic. Once, though, when she went up to him with her soft cajoleries, he quickly swung around and cracked her on the face with his fist, making a crunching sound. Grandmother staggered back, her hands pressed to her lips. Then she straightened up and said softly and calmly, You fool. She spat out blood at his feet, but all he did was let out two piercing shrieks and shout, I'll kill you if you don't go away. Fool, she repeated as she went to the door. Grandfather flung himself on her, but without hurrying. Grandmother stepped through the doorway and slammed the door in his face. Old cow, Grandfather hissed, his face red as a hot coal as he caught hold of the door jam and scratched at it with his fingers. More dead than alive. I sat on the bench, hardly able to believe what I had seen. It was the first time he'd struck grandmother in front of me, and this, for me, was terribly degrading, and revealed a new facet of his character that I could never tolerate, and which humiliated me beyond description. He kept standing there, his nails dug into the jam, growing smaller and grayer, just as if he'd been showered with ash. Suddenly he strode into the middle of the room, kneeled, and unable to keep upright, slumped forward, brushing the floor floor with his arm. Then suddenly he straightened up, hit himself on the tress, and cried out, Oh God. I slid off the warm tiles of the couch by the stove as though I'd been lying on ice and fled. Upstairs, Grandmother was walking up and down the room, rinsing her mouth out. Does it hurt? She went over to the corner, spat the water out into the slop pail, and calmly answered, It's nothing. The teeth aren't broken. Only the lips cut. What did he do it for? Glancing out of the window, she said, lost his temper. It's hard for an old man like him with the failures he's had. Off to bed with you now and forget about all of it. I began to ask her about something else, but she shouted back at me with a sternness that was rare for her. Am I speaking to the wall? Go to bed. You never do what you're told. She sat down by the window and sucked her lip, spitting every few seconds into her handkerchief. As I undressed, I watched her stars twinkled in the blue square of, wood of window above her head. In the street it was quiet and the room was dark. When I got into bed, she came over gently, struck my head, and said, Sleep tight. I'm going down to Grandfather now. Don't feel sorry for me, Angel. I'm as much to blame. Go to sleep. After she had kissed me and left me, I felt unbearably miserable. I jumped out of the wide, soft, warm bed and went to the window. As I gazed into the empty street, I suddenly felt numb and helpless with a hopeless despair.